let me say a few sentences <coughs> about this event. <coughs> it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce you to Professor Perry Smith uh, from Papua. <coughs> Uh, as I learned, Professor Smith is originally from England, as I heard, actually from Ireland. No, no, no. from England. I have some Irish... I, do I say blood or genes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but now... Ancestry. Ancestry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but now Professor <coughs> Smith is at uh, the University of Buffalo. Professor Smith is working on different topics and uh, is very distinguished, uh, distinguished scholar uh, doing different things. Uh, what I'm going to acquaint him with is uh, his uh, distinguished position in, uh, in the history of philosophy, particularly uh, uh, about Husserl, then down in Austrian school. But uh, Professor Smith is also doing very much the field of ontology. Uh, he, is, uh, <coughs> he is director of the National Center for Ontological Research in the University of Bath. Uh, Professor Smith is also winner of a great number of awards. I'm not going to talk <coughs> about all of them because it's a great number. Um, 
documents. And then I'm going to be talking about how documents were rediscovered in Africa. And I'll explain why that is so interesting if you go on. Um, so we live in a world in which there are small scale activities, barbecues, um, campfire parties, country dances, lunch engagements, where people exchange conversationally um, ideas and thoughts and plans and so forth. And the philosophers of language in the analytic tradition have concentrated primarily on such small-scale local conversation between friends. But there are also large-scale social institutions and large-scale social phenomena <coughs> such as uh, governments and wars and uh, epidemics and uh, also uh, uh, urban planning or urban renewal, or urban response to um, emergency disasters. And in those cases, we have people using language not to communicate to two or three or four friends who share their goals, but in order to communicate to thousands or tens of thousands of people who have completely different goals, sometimes contradictory goals. If you own a factory, for instance, then you're going to have to give instructions to the workers in the factory and some of the workers will not share your goals to make you lots of money, they will have goals of their own. That's a train, I guess. Helicopter. It just goes to show, yeah. Now, the hypothesis I want to defend is that these large-scale institutions exist in large part because there are documents. So writing, writing things down, writing instructions down, writing commitments down, was an important presupposition for the possibility of large-scale social institutions. And I will argue that much of the um, <coughs> large-scale content of modern civilization is based upon the existence of documents. So that's the thesis. So I'm going to start by giving you some idea of what I mean by documents. So these are just examples. Um, documents are not only those things made of paper, they are also things which have writing on them, or printing on them, or engraving or embossing on them, which is comparable to the sort of writing or printing that we find on paper. So one of my favorite examples is a policeman's badge. That's a document. And um, the, the, but broadly speaking, I'm going to be concentrating on the examples here in the middle. And these are all examples which have some kind of obligation power, or what so called a deontic power. So I'm not going to be talking very much about novels and newspapers and, and uh, gravestones. Uh, so these are some examples of major types of documents. I'm going to be talking primarily about legal and financial documents, to some extent also about identity documents. I have a lot to say also about the other kinds of documents, but they're not of interest for what I'm talking about today, which is institutional structure and the basis of institutional structure in document acts. Now, there are many things you can do with a paper document, but you can do them with any piece of paper or with uh, other kinds of things. You can burn or lose a piece of paper. But that is not an interesting thing to do with a document. These are not document, document acts. Putting a piece of paper on a shelf is not yet a document act. It, it's something that you can do with a matchbox or a pair of spectacles. Uh, but you can steal a document. That's sort of interesting. You can't steal a speech act. So that's a, a, a pointer to the kind of difference that is going to become important between documents on the one hand, which endure through time, and speech acts, which are evanescent. And the, the importance of enduring through time 
becomes clear when we think about the fact that large-scale social institutions may take several generations to create. Now, if we consider what is true of practically any document, but primarily literary documents, which are in some sense the simplest sort of document, then you can do things like write the document. I put this in parentheses because when you're writing the document, the document doesn't exist. So you're not really doing something with the document by writing it, you are creating the document so that you can do things with it, or other people can do things with it. For instance, read it, or criticize it, or recite it, or perform it, or review it, or accept it for publication. These are all very, very simple and trivial things that you can do with any document, but primarily with a literary document. They are not the sort of thing that you would be likely to do with a financial document. So you don't recite or perform a stock certificate or a bank uh, statement. Uh, unless you're very famous, you're, you probably wouldn't publish your bank statements, and even then, or your tax records may, may be published in certain circumstances. Now, there is what we can do with the document, but there is also what documents themselves do. So documents have powers, social powers, and they can have those powers independently of people actually doing anything. So documents can cite other documents, and they do this in and of themselves. So there are hyperlinks or footnotes or references and citations. Documents provide evidence. So if you publish a scientific paper, you may document the results of your research online in another document which just sits there. People don't have to check the data which you published online. But the data is there and it provides the evidence to support your claims in the published paper, even if no one checks it. More importantly, documents can take over the role of communicating from the author of the document. So in an army or in a factory, you write down instructions on pieces of paper, or on your computer, or on some plastic device. And then those instructions can be conveyed through the hierarchy to other people who need to follow those instructions, and the instructions live on, even if the author of the instructions is no longer involved. And that's the big difference between speech acts and document acts. Speech acts are tied to the original author, and then they go away, they die. Document acts, involve enduring things, namely the documents themselves, which are not tied to the original author. They acquire a life of their own. Now, that means that you can use documents in order to demonstrate that you have a right. The driver's license, for instance, demonstrates to other people, for instance, police people, that you have the right to drive a car. And um, an IOU note documents that you have an obligation to pay somebody a certain amount of money. And this is a document. Um, that this is a, a medium of exchange which gives me certain rights. And if I give it to you, then you will give me something else in exchange for me giving you those rights. You can, by, by accumulating these things, you can accumulate rights, and you can collect a shoebox full of rights. Alright, so as I said, I'm going to focus on legal and financial documents. These are uh, characterizable, first of all, by the fact that they are time-sensitive. So, there are, for all I know, still Yugoslav dinars in shoeboxes. Um, probably you all have some Yugoslav demands. But they're not, they don't carry any rights anymore. They are, are items of curiosity. They're like works of art. So, currency notes are one example of a time sensitive document. But 
very many other kinds of documents that time says. For instance, the plans for um, creating a new kind of good in your factory that were written 50 years ago and were, have already been executed 40 years ago are no longer valid, they're no longer executable, they're no longer documented plans, they are documented former plans, people's the plans that they used to have a long time ago, but not plans that people have today. And again, they, they lose value, they lose executability. So this seems to be a general truth about financial documents and the kinds of documents which uh, are involved in organizing large-scale institutions like commercial enterprises or armies or governments, that the documents that are created <coughs> are valid for a certain period of time, but then lose their validity and then they, they collapse and they become mere curiosities. Uh, so this is a condo in Florida. Um, I guess I should have picked a condo in Riega. Uh, in 2007, a bank in Florida lends you a million dollars and you buy a condo. But then in 2008, the value of your condo and everyone else's condo collapses. So you owe the bank a million dollars, but your condo is only worth $500,000. What many people in that circumstance left the keys in the condo, closed the door and walked away. Now, that turned out to be legal. That was, that was a legal step to take, at least in most states in the United States. So what that meant was that you don't owe the bank any money anymore. The bank owns the condo. The bank saw the condo as the security on the loan. And so, from the point of view of the law, the bank is... Of course, the bank is very unhappy. Uh, you suffer because now your credit rating has gone down. And so you'll find it much harder to get a loan for a certain period of time in the future. But still, this is what people did. Now, to describe this phenomenon is going to involve a lot of documents. So the, the, even though you just leave the keys and close the door, there are many, many documents that, that were created to create the loan and that were used to create the loan and which are then used by the bank to take care of the foreclosure. So these are objects which are part, part of the social ontology. And um, first of all, there is the bank. The bank was created by means of a certain document, articles of uh, association. There is the condo itself, which is a physical object made of glass and carpets and so forth. There is the price that you paid originally. That's, that is an, an entity which is tied very closely to documents and also to people's beliefs and people's wants and so forth. There is the mortgage itself, which exists only because there is a document. So mortgages are essentially document-dependent entities. And that's because when you sign a mortgage note, the bank keeps the note and keeps the deeds of the property together. And you can't say that you own that property and prove it with a document until the bank gives you the deeds back. And they will only do that when you pay off the loan. There is the mortgage contract, which is the document upon which the mortgage depends. There is the signature on the mortgage contract. There is your act of breaching the mortgage contract. And, uh, and so forth. Now I could go on and on this objects. Um, but we can already see that there are a number of ontological questions. What is a debt? What is a mortgage? What is a contract? What is a signature? What is a credit card? What is a credit card number? I find these amazingly interesting questions. But philosophers have ignored these amazingly interesting questions. Very few exceptions. Um, and I, I, I think I know the reason why they've been ignored by philosophers. Um, 
But I'm not going to ignore it. Alright, so Searle so recognized, and other uh, philosophers of law, for instance, have recognized that societies depend upon people being held together by claims and obligations. So um, when we go onto the road in our car, there is a system of traffic laws which we have obliged to ourselves to obey, and the authorities in return have obliged themselves to punish those they catch disobey. And so as a result of this inter-meshing inter between our decision and commitment to obey the laws, and the state's decision and commitment to ensure that the laws are kept, we can drive on the roads with relative safety. <coughs> there will be relatively few mad drivers on the road. I believe this is so even in Croatia. Um, that's because we have a mutually a system of mutually correlated claims and obligations. Now, Searle provided an account of how such claims and obligations come into existence. We perform speech acts. He says, I promise to give you $100 if you mow my lawn. I become obliged to give you $100. If you agree with the promise, you become obliged to mow the lawn. And then, once you've mowed the lawn, I give you the $100. And your claim on me ceases to exist, and my claim on you ceases to exist, so the, the claims and obligations disappear. So, speech acts can bring claims and obligations into existence. I think so is right. I think that, that this is just one of those things. Um, the world contains claims and obligations. That's an ontological thesis. Claims and obligations are metaphysically queer entities, as Mackie would express it. But they exist. And you can't do the ontology of social reality unless you embrace these entities. So still does not know how to embrace these entities because so is a naturalist. He thinks that everything can be studied by means of the science of physics. And claims are not physical entities. But the problem for so is that it works only for a small village or a small family. If I say, I will mow your lawn for hundred dollars, you can look into my eyes and see that I mean it. You might even pay me in advance because you know me so well and that I'm an honest lawn mowing type of person. But if somebody off the street knocks on your door and says, if you give me hundred dollars now, I will mow your lawn tomorrow, you've never seen this person you probably won't give him the money. But you're giving the bank the, your money all the time. You let these strange people whose names you don't even know take hundreds of kronas, hundreds of kuna. You give them to a str perfect stranger behind a glass wall all the time. Now, this is not because the stranger behind the glass wall has promised to take care of your money. No one ever gave you that promise. But you have documents. You get a receipt. They have documents. They document the fact that you are looking after, they are looking after your money. And um, in the local case, which is the case the cell deals primarily with, the obligations and claims exist because of memories. But in the global case, they exist because of documents. Now, I believe that the person who made the most progress on understanding these issues is a Peruvian economist by the name of Hernando de Soto, who founded a think tank called the Institute for Liberty and Democracy in Peru. And De Soto has a thesis which is analogous to the Searle, Searle thesis. Searle's thesis is about how we create claims and obligations in a local society of friends with shared goals. De Soto has a thesis about how documents can be used to create 
institutional orders of modern societies. And I'll give you some examples. Um, he, his, his examples come from economics. So his examples all have to do with the way capitalism works. But the, I think the examples can be general. So, so, the Soto's idea is that all of these things, bank accounts, stocks, shares, bonds, mortgages, credit cards, and so forth, form systems, institutional systems, which came into existence because of documents. The docu there are document systems connected to each of these kinds of activity. So banking is a system whereby people look after your money, do things with it, which bring benefits to both sides. That banking system rests upon an underlying document system. What, what De Soto noticed was that stocks and shares and the pensions which rest on stocks and shares allow distributed ownership of large social objects such as commercial enterprises, IBM or Chevron or Shell Oil. They are owned by tens of thousands of people who buy shares in IBM or Chevron. And those shares are just documents. But they are documents which give a mathematically exact fraction of ownership of a mathematically exact fraction, correspondingly mathematically exact fraction, of the entire company. Now, this is amazing if you think about it. Shell Oil is made of the human capital of its employees, Oil rigs spread across the world, vans, pipes, uh, delivery mechanisms, computers, and so forth, land, um, rights, a huge mishmash of many different kinds of things. But someone who owns a share in Shell Oil owns exactly one ninety-six thousand of that aggregate of mixed things. That's amazing. The fact that we can divide shell oil into 96,000 parts is a miracle. This is what De Soto calls the mystery of capital. The miracle works. People get to own 196,000 of shell oil, and that's what makes pensions possible. That's how the pension system in capitalist countries, anyway, works. The pensions buy fractions of companies on your behalf, and then they pay you back those fractions incrementally when they pay your pension later on. So, document act theory is about that kind of system. It's about the powers of documents to divide companies into tiny but exact mathematical fractions. The social interactions which those documents are used in, and which the documents enable. For instance, wills. So documents allow you to give instructions to people who will execute them after you are dead. Um, and then the institutional systems which documents make possible, both institutional systems of documents themselves and institutional systems of actions which are made possible by them. A very simple example is the passport. So there are passport acts. And when you initiate the validity of your passport, you perform um, at least three passport acts. So you sign it. That means it is henceforth valid. But you also attest to the correctness of the information in it. So your signature is not just an initiating act, it's also an attesting act. But your signature is also providing a pattern <coughs> that can, someone else can compare to another signature which you perform in their presence. So the signature enables the passport to be used to check your identity. So, and then once the passport has been initiated, it can be used for other passport acts, such as proving your identity or checking your identity. 
or preventing you from leaving the country, or stopping you from entering the country. All right, so other kinds of document powers are title deeds can create property, they can convert a piece of land into a piece of real estate. Um, a, a diploma can create a PhD. A marriage license can create a bond of matrimony. All of these are real problems for Mackie. These are all queer metaphysical entities. Um, Alright, so we have the creative power of documents. There are problems with the creative power of documents if you uh, think about initiating cases. So, when the Declaration of Independence was signed by certain people, citizens of the United Kingdom in 1766 or whenever it was, they were performing an illegal document act. But it is now deemed to have been a legal document act because it worked. So the signing of the Declaration of Independence turned out to bring about a situation in which independence was not only declared, but actually came to be a fact. As a result of which the legality of that uh, document became real. The illegality became uh, a, a mistake. So now the English people who think that all of these illegal in, the, in that part of the United Kingdom, which they call the United States of America, are just regarded as being uh, benighted fools because the Declaration of Independence was a successful document act. All right, so Africa. The Soto, with his think tank, is attempting to use these facts about documents in order to help poor people in the third world. And Bill Clinton, who is a friend of the, the Soto, describes his efforts in these, uh, along these lines as the most promising anti-poverty initiative in the world. Now, uh, the, the, what the Soto wants to do is to show how documents create wealth rather than poverty. And he wants to show how this is happening in Africa. But he wants to show also that what is happening in Africa today is analogous to what happened in the West hundreds of years ago. Because we had to create those first documents too. So he's interested in the history of documents. I'm going to talk about what's happening in Africa based on his researches, since he's worked in many African countries, to study how documents are being created by the people in order to create wealth, but also how you can help them to create those documents, to create even more wealth. And basically his strategy is to convert mere land <coughs> into real estate. So at the moment in a country like Tanzania, or when he started in a country like Tanzania, the poor people were living as squatters on land which they did not own. He brought it about that they were given title deeds, so the land that they were squatting on was now their own property. That was a very difficult thing to do. He did it successfully in Peru. It was a very difficult thing to do because the people involved are, are almost all of them illiterate. So you're giving them a piece of paper which explains that they own this piece of land, but they can't read it. And they, they need to be schooled in what it means and why it's significant. And the first consequence in Peru of De Soto's efforts was that literacy among girls increased significantly because the girls had been the people who had protected the squatters' rights during the day. They couldn't go to school because someone had to sit on the land and ensure that no one else would come and squat where the, the, the uh, family was living. So, in a country like Tanzania, there are two cultures. There is the culture of the cities, which is basically a Western uh, culture.
Potter with writing and lawyers and notaries and uh, banks and so forth. And then there is the rest of the country, which is a, 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 an extra legal part of the country. But they, they have cell phones. The cell phones which are on the fringes of the law. Uh, and the, the cell phones are rented. And it's a kind of black market in cell phones, but it functions far, far better than the official government run phone system, which probably doesn't reach your village anymore. They have the equivalent of property registries. So each village has what is called a men when keti, which is a village chairman, and one of the roles of the village chairman is to keep the documents. Documents which are gradually accumulated. So, um, one of the kinds of documents that the Wenya Keti keeps is an identity document. So, if somebody needs to leave the village to go to the next village and prove his identity, the Wenya Keti will create an identity document. And he will have an official stack to make it look legal. And then there are um, cattle branding. The cattle brandings will correspond to documents kept by the Mwenyaketi so that you can see which brand implies ownership by which village resident. And they have then dispute resolution by the elders in the village. And these disputes will be disputes about land, for instance, where two parcels of land meet, and there will be handwritten uh, dispute resolution documents which will include maps so that people now know who owns which land in the area of the district. And thereby, the documents and the adjudication system are creating property rights. And what SOTA wants to do is to accelerate that system by having the government give property rights to all the people in all the villages very quickly. So, there is a registration run by the Mwenyiketi, which enables people to go to the Mwenyiketi's office and check what the document said, who owns what land. Maybe you want to buy some land. Maybe you're an oil company and you want to buy the land in, in a certain area in order to drill for oil. Before that, you were just sending some troops. Now you have to find out who owns the land and then you have to negotiate how much they're willing to uh, so, so here we see how documents are bundled into dossiers in the way that a mortgage note and a title deed are bundled in a bank. And these bundlings are documentary counterparts of the bundling of people in the world. As, as debtors and creditors, for instance, or as man and wife, or as partners in a small company. Um, these kinds of social networks are held in place by registration of documents in the registration office, which documents what the rights and obligations are of the people in the network in relation to the other people in the network. Uh, for instance, when you have a bank account, you become bundled together with other people who have a bank account in the same village. And the bank account then serves, the bank account, bank book serves as an identification document. And the identification document, if it's going to work, since these people can't write, if it's going to work, it's going to have to have all kinds of uh, clues which you can use in an illiterate culture in order to check that it is really the bank, uh, uh, bank account book and the identity document for the person in question. So you have a, um, you probably can't see it, but there is a fingerprint there, and you have pictures, and you have stamps and counter stamps and counter signatures all of which are designed to bring about multiple redundant ways of checking the authenticity of this particular document. Alright, so I talked about the mystery of capital. Now I'm going to conclude 
I'm going to really flash home the point about the uh, metaphysical queerness of these entities. So Mackey is an English philosopher who argues that the ethical and the normative is really a matter of fiction. That we tell stories to each other about planes and obligations, but there's nothing really there. And his argument is the argument for metaphysical queerness. What is an obligation or a plane? What is a right? They're, these are not entities that we know from doing empirical science, so what could they be? I want to bite the bullet of metaphysical queerness. I want to argue that we should be taking seriously the idea that there are such things as debts which are special kinds of obligations. Now, debts have mathematical properties. You can sell your debts, you can divide your debts, exactly, in just the same way that you can divide a number. But the, there is a difference between a debt as a mathematical entity and the number seven. And the difference has to do with history. A debt is time sensitive. It will one day cease to exist when it's paid back. But the number seven is not time sensitive. Now, I don't think that Plato, or indeed most other philosophers, can cope with a world in which there are historical and mathematical entities. I think Mackey is probably comfortable with mathematical entities, but he finds historical mathematical entities metaphysically queer. Now, I believe that, that we just truly have to bite the bullet and accept that there are these metaphysically queer entities, and they are what make social reality of the modern store possible. And that's the end.
Um, uh, why, why, so when you play cards, you have chips on, on money, mainly mm -hmm. chips. Do you think the chips are not? Yeah. Okay, so what is it about the cards that makes you not want them to be documents, other than you want to win this argument? It seems that they, they function very similarly to the way money functions. So you, you have them in your hand and you exchange them, put them back, and take some new ones out. It sounds like documents to me, but in any case, they are like documents. So there is a social activity which cannot be performed without some kind of physical, mechanical aid which involves printing numbers and symbols on pieces of card. You agree with that? Yeah. Okay, then I think I will. <laughs>
face-to-face uh, agreements. How do we how do we preserve the normative dimension? How do we make things last longer and be spread out further and work across diverse populations? I didn't express myself clearly. I try to confess. Why we cannot cash out the ontological peculiarity of documents in terms of dispositions? So, the documents are physical objects that enable different types of dispositions in physical organisms like us. I'm trying to defend a kind of brutal nationalistic view. Why do you think this cannot be done? Okay, good. Uh, uh, is the problem because documents are somehow related to the normative? Okay, good. So, uh, I believe in dispositions, and I think that the dispositions are at work all over the place here. Um, I, um, I, I, I'm not sure how clued in you are to the realism discussions that people like Nenat and Petar have been involved in recently. I'm, I'm a very, very um, a convinced, intense. Realist, I'm an extreme realist. I think debts exist. Now, you could say a debt is a disposition. Um, the disposition is maintained through time because of certain documents. But all we have is the person on the one side who owes the debt, and the person on the other side, or the person in his army on the other side, who are due the repayment. And then documents keep your uh, desires to have the debt paid alive, and they remind me. Um, the idea of all of that would be to enable you to describe the state of affairs without quantifying it with debts, without admitting that there are debts. Now, I would much prefer to say we have that description of this nexus between those people and those people involving these decisions. They it's clear that that's what we mean when we say there is a debt. Therefore, there are debts. Now, but I can go further. I can say, 100 years later, somebody might write a history of great Croatian debtors, or great Croatian bankrupts, and they would be writing about those debts. They wouldn't be writing about dispositions. They'd be writing about the debts. Somebody else might, in a bank might say, is he a good risk? He has these debts and, and, and he never paid them back. And so people are talking about debts all the time in other financial transactions. So we have not just the first order dispositions, we have second order and third order dispositions. I can, I, I can show you diagrams of how these dispositions work. And those, those third order dispositions can only be described if you allow so that's my case. That you can't describe <coughs> the levels of socioeconomic reality unless you allow the debts. So you find that the debts are not reducible to any disposition? No, I claim that debts are part of a, 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 a social reality which includes essentially also dispositional things as well as documents, okay. as well as people. Okay, when you claim that there are debts, are yeah. they reducible to dispositions or so, not? So you said that you are real. What do you mean by that? Good. So I'm not. I'm not a, a reductionist theorist. I'm an adequatist theorist. But I will take your challenge. Um, <coughs> so um, let's suppose that it was possible to describe this particular structure involving these positions and these other things as being a debt. Then, in one sense, the debt would have been reduced to a certain stru complicated structure of this position. And that's what people mean by debt, but they find it very useful to talk about debts. So, debts exist. In your sense, they are reducible to dispositions. And so we can agree. So let us agree. Okay. I think there are debts. You think there are debts, but you don't think debts are extra debts. Yeah. <coughs> well, I, um, I must, uh, okay. So I think that they are, in a sense, that in the following sense, not extra entities. If you have an orange, 
then you also have two half oranges. You can re-describe having one orange as being having two half oranges. Then you're not in principle. No, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. One
on the lake. Where did we die? And there are treaties. So that there are documents precisely to answer that question. And it's complicated. It depends what your citizenship is, whether it was a boat, whether you were swimming, whether you were close to the shore. Uh, but there is, a, there is always a unique answer to the question where you die, even though there is no unique answer to the question where the border between Austria and Switzerland lies. That having been said, I think that we will have to deal with systems, with document systems, which crush each other, which are not calibrated. Um, that's, you know, we're going to have to deal with that, because there are cases, as you say, where passports of one country are not recognized. In fact, we, we lived through such cases. We, we've had it in the 20th century. East Germany is an example. Yeah. Um, so then we don't need to have all the computer systems go down because 
have the computer systems and the bank holdings for one particular mortgage go down? Because I insist that the documents are essential for the mortgage. Those documents are protected very carefully in very, very tough steel safes. Um, now, you're, we have to assume that all the computer inscriptions relating to this document, uh, relating to these documents, are el eliminated, and the steel safe somehow burns. It, it's a <coughs> science fiction example, but even if we allow that through some <laughs> Okay, but the, the lawyer for the mortgage holder is going to keep copies. So for the, for the mortgage holder and for the mortgage, the, the person with the mortgage, they, they, they don't keep copies in their own interest because the mortgage, the, the, the person who has the mortgage will have a copy of the deed which is being kept in the bank. So it will be possible to reconstruct most of what is involved, even under the situation that you described, precisely because people will keep multiple copies. So, that was interesting. Um, maybe the one reason why we understand the different ways of things is because when we talk about speech acts, um, speech acts actually create some um, the has these dominant powers or can have this creative uh, or creates things. And then you claim also that the, uh, there are the creative power of documents so that the uh, I don't know, bankruptcy certificates to bank bankrupts. Um, maybe this word that they create is the word that bothers me or us. Maybe the document is represented <coughs> or no. referred to. Because if we have the just represent, then you don't need it. Right? Okay, um, so let me, first of all, uh, express an agreement with the spirit of what you're saying. So, the bankruptcy certificate yeah. will be the end result of a process, almost certainly a process involving a lot of speech acts and a lot of document acts. So, proofs will need to be brought forward. Uh, the, the, the person who is going to be bankrupt is going to have proof that he doesn't have secret bank accounts and, and things like that. So there is a process. There are speech acts in that process. Some of them, there are secret signing acts in that process. Now, if you agree that speech acts can give rise to claims and obligations, then I would ask you to agree also that that process can give rise to someone being declared bankrupt. So it creates a bankrupt. It creates that property of a person being a bankrupt. Or being bankrupt, I guess. Do you agree with that? I'm not sure. <laughs> now what I, what I would say is, and I, I am being a little bit poetic in my use of English now, in, in that statement. I said, the bankruptcy certificate creates the bankrupt. What I will now say more carefully is, there is this process involving lots of speech acts and lots of document acts. This process has two outputs, a bankruptcy certificate and coincident with the creation of the certificate is the creation of the bankrupt. Are you willing to accept that? Um, I have to think about it. So that seems, but I, that, that seems almost trivial. That certainly you agree that the person is a bankrupt because of the process. I'm That's just what the process is. I'm just having this problem with this word create. I've stopped using it. I used output. I used output. Okay. I just think the documents represent or refer to obligations. No, the representation yeah. won't do. So there are certainly many documents which represent. And I'm not denying that. Certainly the bankruptcy certificate represents that John Smith <coughs> is bankrupt. I want to say that representing um, so I can have a document which represents one hundred dollars it's not a hundred dollars I can have a, another document which is a hundred dollars so there's a difference between a document which represents something and a document which is that thing 
And sometimes documents can represent things which don't exist in the physical world. So when you have an electronic bank account, there are certain representations of your fortune in the computer or on some printout to state your bank statement. A piece of paper that says you own $10,000 or whatever it is. That is a representation of your $10,000. Now there is no $10,000 which is your $10,000. But you own it nonetheless. So the representation document is, is a special kind of document. And the bankruptcy certificate is, involves representation, but it involves this other more special kind of documenting. They don't take Documents systems can go wrong. 
and massive inflation is a good example of the way a doctor's system could go wrong. Or con uh, contracts is another way in which a doctor's system could go wrong. So um, one could imagine that the Declaration of Independence was a kind of contract which went well. Um, but it might have gone wrong. Uh, so I agree with you that there are strange possibilities here, but I think that we have to be careful to think through them. So part of my um, suggestion here uh, is that there are issues, uh, uh, particularly with, with the use of computers in the stock market. There are issues about the creation of new value through computer magic, which are changing the world. Sometimes for the good, sometimes not so good. Philosophers are not thinking about how it's possible to create new value or to create money by computer means. And I'm trying to think through those. So, so you see 
image that inflation shows that real is about hundred dollars bill is false. Why? <coughs> because it's value that decrease, decrease. But it's value. still mathematically exact and it's still dividable mathematically. But it does not have the same buying power. I didn't say anything about buying ah, power. No, no, so the mathematicalness uh -huh. of financial let me, let me get this straight. The mathematicalness of debts and of um, sums of money that you owe has purely to do with the fact that you can divide them and sum them in the same way that you divide and sum numbers. Mm -hmm. But they have some kind of value of it, and I didn't claim that that was fixed in any sense, and it obviously isn't. Mm -hmm. And you don't need inflation for that. You can have it. You so, uh, okay, one well, question along the lines of now. So there's this kettle branding, so I'm branding my house yeah. somewhere in Texas, so. and these brands are, in a sense, they are documents. Yeah. Okay. You're, getting, you're getting the idea. Yeah. And, however, what, it seems that uh, branding presupposes something else, that is rights. Yep. I'm allowed to brand, yeah. entitled to brand the car only if, if, if you are mine. Yeah, if you're allowed, right. If, only if it's yours. Yeah, only if it's mine. So, if the branding is not what makes it mine, something else before that makes it mine? Um, yes, um, probably something involving a document. You go to the cattle market, you give money, you sign a document, they give you the cattle, you take it home, you brand it. Uh, I didn't say that you make it your property by branding, I said you brand what is your property in order that other people can recognize that it's your property. Now that can be very important. Okay. Okay. So that's why policemen wear badges. It's not that wearing a badge makes you a policeman, because you can wear someone else's badge. It's that wearing a badge makes other people think that you should be given a certain respect uh, because you're a policeman. And maybe even more importantly, wearing the badge means that people can see what the name is so that if you behave badly, they can report you. Okay, but then the document is something contingent. It's not the main thing. The so, main thing. in some cases, it's the main thing. In the mortgage case, it's the main thing. In the police and badge case, it's not the main thing. Uh, a very close example to a policeman's badge is what in some parts of the United States, I understand, and I never did this, but uh, it's called a muscle sticker. A muscle sticker is a little license sticker thing that you can stick on your boat. And if you have that muscle sticker, you can pick muscles from certain coastal zones. So the muscle, you need to have that muscle sticker. You, you get, you only have one, you pay the money, you stick it on your boat. I think that's how it is. So here the document is central. You can still pick muscles illegally, but if you want to pick muscles, well, I don't even know if that's the correct word. Do you want to pick muscles? I guess. I can. Uh, but if you want to do it legally, you have to have a muscle stick. It may be that if you want to be a, a policeman on duty, you have to wear your badge. So there's some kind of essentialness of the documents. <coughs> <laughs> so thank you for the talk. Um, I have two more clarification questions, but one has already been answered uh, by because it was a question similar to Professor Sinjina. And the second one, which kind of follows from it, is well, I'm also wondering what would be the difference between a document and a document act. Because would be uh, a difference similar to the one between semantics and pragmatics in language. Because, you know, then you might have a document, now the, I'm not talking about the document as a paper material, object, but the document as a language with all its semantics, and then you have document acts, which are certain kind of acts which are sensitive to a context and other stuff. So that might kind of fix certain kind of problems we can come to when we talk to the 
that was similar to the one that Professor Snezhna brought up? And it's because in your talk you were using, you were mainly using the word document. So that is a very interesting question. Not document acts. So at a certain point I was thinking whether you think document and document acts so is another solution. Right? So one solution might be uh, semantics and grammatics and document and document act. And you distinguish that. That's the first solution. But another solution might be, you might say, documents equal to document acts. Whereas, you know, because you were using it like that, so I thought yeah. you might be using that like that because also it's connected to the thing you said in speech act. We have the speaker, we have, you know, it's speech act, we have the speaker. But then it's the question, what are who is the speaker in the document, on the other hand? And then you said something like, then you lead us through all this historical, you know, movement or creation of the document. So one might say, once the document has been created, document equals to document act, because it's, it at least in power, it has its force until it stops to have it because of its other semantics or So there are two different solutions, and I'm just wondering to which side. All right, so first of all, I think your question is very interesting for the following reason. Linguists talk about semantics and pragmatics. Right. Pragmatics is about what you can do with language. But if I'm clear about what linguists actually think about when they do pragmatics, then they're thinking about promising, questioning, replying. In other words, they're thinking about speech acts. Then they're thinking about speech act pragmatics. They're not thinking about releasing or storing or expunging or, or annulling or um, amending or any of those document specific things. So I think that one implication of, of, the, of your question is that I am doing a, a hugely exploded kind of linguistic pragmatics. Let, let, let me go a little bit further. One issue which arises for this exploded linguistic pragmatics is that one and the same document can have multiple authors, both simultaneously, because many documents are signed by many people, many documents are authored by many people, but also diachronically, because in big organizations very often, one document is passed to someone else who then makes changes, and then it's passed to someone else who makes changes. So you get a cumulative multi -author. Now, with regard to your main question, I think it's trivial. A document is like a table, it's an object. A document act is like a waving of the hand, it's a process. So we perform document acts, we create documents, we destroy documents, but acts we perform. So that part is simple. I don't think that's an issue. Yeah, okay, because I was thinking about the of documents to be as a word, you know, so as a, a word. Like a, so a document so, is, so, is a state a static enduring collection of words, whether on paper yes, or in a so computer. This is just analogy. I'm not trying to or or symbols, diamonds and spades and right, right. So right, I was trying no. to yeah, I was just trying to draw the analogy. I'm not trying to put documents in semantics and pragmatics in right. language. So there I don't see so if we take a document to be as a word, you know, with its semantics. So as you were not talking, you're speaking about, you know, many people can sign a document. Yeah. So on the other hand, you know, certain words were created by people, you know, it doesn't matter. So this part doesn't matter, you know. It's still there is analogy have a general world, like let's say uh, a horse. So certain people contributed to that word comes to exist. And then I was thinking if you take a document to be on that not material level, but a document, uh, let's say a badge which you use. So there is one badge and there is, I'm not talking about the material, but like, let's say semantics, which has certain semantics, which is neutral. 
and then you enhance depending on which listener you give it, that this app is different. So I can <coughs> like I can with this that. one I quit, so there is a badge that has its semantics. It says, you know, I'm a policeman. And then I, you know, I quit and then the chief, the office gives it to another person. So that is the app, you know. In that sense, the badge has destroyed certain apps. Depending on the context, you know, to be... I can agree with all of that. So, okay, so we have a badge with its semantics. Means but remember, when you give it to the other policeman, you have to change the name. Which means changing the semantics. Okay, then. So it's a different language, I would say. So it's not even necessary to be able to, on a broader level, just a badge? Absolutely. I think that the, you know, I, okay, so the so badge is, it, it has two parts. The name and, it, and the holder of the name. And the holder of the name, you, it's, the, it's the semantically in, in, uninteresting part. The only interesting part is the name. So if you give it to someone else, you have to change the interesting part. And at that point, we already have it. The that would be one act that you can perform, cancelling the original badge and substituting a new name. I guess they have to do that with guns. The gun isn't a document. But the gun will be documented. Um, I have a question concerning, I think it kind of connects with Professor Bench said about inflation. Um, well, the question is about how social awareness or, or individual awareness about the ontologies of these documents, whether they influence how these ontologies are constituted or how they're constructed, in the sense that if we for, if we don't if we don't know the information conveyed by a certain document or what it stands for or what it is, whether that influences, influences it in any way. Um, so, for example, in, in our economic system, we have loads of documents uh, in the so banknotes, uh, other kinds of documents. But if, if we um, if we imagine the case, uh, it will be a kind of a futuristic case in which we were, in which we manage to program our our system so to avoid all these documents because they're, they're needed if they serve some utility. Uh, so if we were to avoid them, then they merely become a program. So our let's say that our our economic system becomes automated in some way. Uh, they are. These documents are, I, I would suppose, according to what you were saying, they would be conveyed in the programs that were that would be driving the system. But let's say after 20 years, we all forget about the actual data of these documents. We don't really understand them because we don't need them. We, we simply use up use up the system in a, in a very small way in which we use up computers, right? We don't have to understand each and every program there is in a computer in order to use it. Now, does this affect the document ontologies in any way, or not? So, in this point you just described is happening all the time. Most of the information in most banks in the Western world is never seen by any human being. It's just churned uh, by the computers. <laughs> the computers are, are instructed to give just a tiny fraction of information according to need. And so comes in and wants money from their bank, or when somebody wants to transact a, uh, a sale. But could we say that if, if certain documents are completely automated within the system, they cease to be documents, they're, they're really part of a mechanism that brings about certain certain outcomes, but it's in no way a document to do what yeah, the way should present. That's, that's a good question. So, high frequency trading, which I think now takes more than half of the activity at the stock exchange in the US goes so quickly that you couldn't record it on paper, certainly. I guess it must be recorded computationally, but there, there are, I don't know, a million transactions in a second or something crazy like that. Uh, by multiple computers. Um, and then I'm not sure whether that they are, I guess they must be recording everything. I'm not even sure that that's the case. So if, if, I, if we were so to... Hang on, let me just think through your question because I, 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 didn't, I didn't think I answered it yet. So let's suppose that they don't record. They just transact. No documents. Any more than if you go down to the market and buy a banana. You put the money on the thing and you take the banana. 
No documents. Um, then there are no documents. That's fine. I don't like documents particularly. Um, if there is something going on, it's always more documents. <coughs> Sure, but I, I was trying to say that it seems that certain documents are being automated within the system. Maybe you can still track them down, but nobody cares for them anymore because it, they become oh, obsolete okay. in some way. Good. So, that's so that's does that affect their does that affect their document ontology? This kind of real this way, which you're presenting. Okay. So let's let's just change the scenario a little bit from what we had a minute ago. Supposing that the high frequency trading is such that document records are not kept, but you can, if you need one, you can program the computer to give you a, a record of a certain range of transactions. Then the documents would be generated on demand. So there are no documents, but there is always a possibility to create a document. Now, the, um, you, so that would avoid your, your more recent question, in the sense that you, you, you demand the documents because you want to look at them. And so they, they are still not only documents, but they're actually documents which someone will inspect. So now let's consider a case where a lot of documents are being produced, but no one is looking at them. That case, to me, does not sound interesting. So presumably they are like other documents which are being inspected, and so they're just extra documents. The fact that no one's looking at them is not interesting. So if there's no awareness of these documents, they don't really have an apology. No, I, I'm saying they're just lots of documents. They don't, they don't have any interesting things. Uh, now, I, let me see if I can, I can find an interesting version of your question. Uh, so, let's suppose that for whatever reason computers create random records which no one can make any sense of and no one cares. They are not documents. They're just a random outbursts of the computer. So it's like a, 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 a dog barking. So to be a document you have to be capable of being interpreted on the basis of some recognizable social practice, something like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you something in connection with the last five, the one which you mentioned, the one that starts you. Let me see if I can... Wait, wait okay, fine, uh, okay. I remember this. I can find it. Um, you keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> to ask you uh, to clarify a bit this slide because when you talk about bank loan, we mean the bank loan, uh, loan type or token? Because you're talking about bank loan type and I agree it's, it's an understood and not structure but it's not a time connected. If you're talking about the bank loan token, it's time connected but it's not an understood and not structure. It's an understood something that eventually exemplifies so I think a bank loan token is in one respect analogous to a mathematical structure, namely it's perfectly divisible and perfectly combinable. So, so you is mathematical something that can be done perfectly well. Say say again. Um, you use the word mathematical in for me in rather strange way. Because there are uh, problems that can be done and still mathematical. Of a okay, then let me, let me uh, change the subject. <laughs> uh, I have actually some more slides, uh, which uh, I thought I had no slides. Yeah. No, I, I know, I hit them. <laughs> So, what is a credit card number, or a social security number, or a bank account number? It, it consists of nine digits or eleven digits. What is it? Is it a mathematical object? I don't know. I think it, on the face of it, it looks as if it's somehow analogous to a mathematical object. Well, 
But is it is it is it a number? Is just the parent card number a number? It's not just a number. Good. Okay. And similarly, a debt, a hundred dollar debt, is not just a number, but it does involve some numerical features. That's all I want to say. With it. I, I I do want to say more, but in response to your question, that's all, the only claim I've made. That we're dealing here with entities which have mathematical a mathematical dimension. I agree that... Uh, yeah. and, and in most of the numbers that we use in our ordinary life are not like that. So your height, we express in a number, but it's not a mathematical entity because the number will just be an approximation. Your height is not a mathematical Approximation is also Your age is closer. But what? Approximation is also part of mathematical. Oh, I know, but I'm talking about this simple sense of mathematical, meaning addable and dividable exactly. And heights are not addable in the vice versa. Okay. And this is not mathematical. Credit card number is not dividable. You don't divide a credit card number. It doesn't make sense. Well, you do divide debts. People divide their debts. They sell half of them or they, they pay off half or they bequeath half each to their children. Really kind. Yeah. I don't want to disappoint you, but you look so disappointed. Well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 